first for everybody. Uh, can we call the roll? Yes. Um, Council Member Fleming, Mayor Rogers. Present. Chair Rogers. Here. All right, let the record reflect that um, all subcommittee members are present with the exception of Council Member Fleming. Excellent, so two constitutes quorum. Uh, we'll start with our approval for minutes. We have the November 1st draft minutes uh, for presentation. Do you have any changes to the mayor? No, sir. Let's see if there's any public comment on it. All right, seeing none, we'll bring it back and show them adopted if there's no objection. I think we're good. None. Cool. We'll go on to our department reports then. And I do not have anything for you today. Perfect. We'll go to new business. Item 5.1, development of the city's comprehensive integrated pest management policy. Do you pull it up? Is it in here? You should be able to share from there. And we have Sean McNeil presenting on this today, Deputy Director of Environmental Services for Santa Rosa Water. Is it loaded on? Mm -hmm. It's loaded. Good afternoon, Chair Rogers and uh, Mayor Rogers. Uh, excited to be here for our second installment of the uh, Citywide Integrated Pest Management. Uh, since we last talked, uh, there were a number of questions that we received from the committee. Uh, so we did a little bit of research uh, and uh, brought some of that information back. And our hope is to uh, next bring this to uh, full council to get gr uh, greater feedback. Um, and eventually a second reading for a final adoption of a policy. So. All right, so today's outline is just to kind of talk a little bit about the goal of integrated pest management, just make sure we're, we're in alignment there. Uh, uh, share the existing guidance, did go back and look at uh, previous guidance from council and um, and from our Board of Public Utilities. So I'll just summarize what, what uh, we've had so far uh, and then go through some of the impacts that um, we've put together uh, that if we do have product bans on our operations, so we'll kind of go through those. Also then talk about a typical integrated pest management program as they're designed just to make sure that you're familiar with that process um, because it is, I think it is intended to meet similar goals to banning pesticides, but it's just a different approach. Uh, and then uh, we have some staff recommendations that we're open for feedback on and then move on to next steps. Uh, so just wanna make sure, uh, cause this has kind of come up as other people have reviewed the presentation that we're very clear uh, when we use the term pesticide. Uh, pesticide really is any chemical that's used to eradicate pests. And so it includes herbicides that kill plants, insecticides that are designed to kill or control insects, fungicides that kill fungi and such. Um, so just wanted to make sure when we use pesticide, we're talking about the overall. Uh, but in particular, a lot of the um, information that we've gotten uh, or direction that we've uh, received from council has really been about one active compound, well, two, neonicotinoids, which is a, a group of compounds, as well as glyphosate. So glyphosate is the active ingredient and the common uh, weed removal roundup. Uh, and there was some discussion last time about how the, the chemical names keep changing. And, and this is what doesn't change. Glyphosate doesn't change. They will reformulate um, different herbicides to affect different types of plants or to meet environmental criteria in different types of habitats. So for an example, glyphosate, when it's put in Roundup, that's for use on terrestrial habitats. When it's put in a product called Rodeo, 
that's used for um, aquatic habitats to go after aquatic weeds. So same compound is still glyphosate. So even if the trade names uh, or if the name of the product changes, the functional um, ingredient is still glyphosate. Um, then just kind of launch into integrated pest management. Our goal is really to develop a citywide integrated pest management policy. Right now, Parks has um, a department procedure. The water department has something a little bit different. So we just don't have something that's, this is what we do here in the city. So that's one of the goals of this policy. Uh, and it is designed to provide um, guidance to staff and contractors who are working on city property uh, to ensure that these landscapes are designed and maintained in a manner that reduces the need for both fossil fuels, uh, powered, you know, fossil fuel powered equipment, herbicides, insecticides, and other anthropomorphic inputs um, that have an ability to exacerbate climate change. And that's why we're bringing this first to this uh, committee. Uh, and then it ensures that the policy supports the city's ability to protect against uh, increased fire severity due to invasive species and climate change. And so Paul is gonna be here. He'll talk about a little bit of that. We just wanna make sure that we understand the implications of any changes that we make in our integrated pest management and how that's um, gonna fit with some of the other things we're trying to do to protect our community from fire. So um, the citywide uh, applicability, uh, this was a question that came up. Uh, it would only apply on city owned properties uh, or properties that are managed by the city. Um, it's not a building code, uh, so it doesn't dictate personal use. That, that would potentially could be covered through building codes. It's, it's more problematic when um, uh, dealing with personal use chemicals on private property. Um, but that this is not gonna cover that. And it does not have any control over county, state, uh, federal, or school district owned properties. Um, so it really would just be um, related to our properties. Uh, when looking at the county um, parks, uh, new IPM that they just passed, I think what we're proposing today is very much in alignment with what the county has approved. And they've put in some bans, um, uh, state and federal, uh, they're all over the place. Uh, uh, and school districts in general, I think we would be pretty much in alignment with at least their practices um, as far as what we're proposing for noticing and things like that, which are above and beyond the minimum requirements. Um, so we had uh, looking around at a study, uh, and this is something that has been difficult to find, um, but at UC Davis um, Ag Extension Office uh, did a study on various herbicides in a golf course. And what you see here is uh, a bunch of pictures through time taken on, on five foot by five foot square um, pieces where they applied different treatments and took pictures uh, on the day of control and then, uh, you know, before the control, day after, and all the way out to 35 days. And then they looked at a bunch of different um, uh, products. And what you can see is the red line. These are all the different kinds of organic sprays. Um, these are considered what, the, what they call our burn down chemicals, uh, meaning that they um, burn, they basically burn the vegetation doesn't necessarily kill it at the root, but it burns it down from the top. And this is in alignment with, with some of the um, experiments that we've done in our staff, uh, is that when we spray with some of these organic sprays, we're not getting effective kills. And you can see after uh, day 14, on many of these, they're starting to look closer and closer to the control all the way out to day 35. So it's showing glyphosate as a as an effective tool at, at um, taking care of vegetation, this this type of vegetation here. And so um, just wanted to just show that to you so that you had an understand when we start talking about the impacts to our operations, you know, there's there's a level of service we're trying to attain at the same time, if we don't have all of the tools to attain it, 
that's why we're going to start coming into you know greater amounts of spraying, greater amounts of time um, dedicated towards that activity. So um, the feedback that we've received from policymakers so far is in city council over a number of different years have um, required that uh, in our landscape contracts that there would be no use of glyphosate. Uh, uh, active ingredient, which is the active ingredient roundup, as we talked about, for eradicating plants, and also the no use of neonicotinoid uh, insecticides. And the reason for that is these are um, are broad insecticides, meaning they kill beyond the target species. Um, and so uh, it was determined that the threat to uh, butterflies and bees was too great. And so we didn't want that um, being used. And so uh, that's what's happened since I think 2018 when that first came in. Uh, so we haven't used that. Uh, and then on the Board of Public Utilities for our landscape contracts and almost all of our properties are, are maintained by an outside landscaper, uh, develop um, uh, Russian River friendly landscape guidelines which isn't necessarily an outright ban on glyphosate, uh, but it is a way of thinking about managing a landscape that moves you away from chemicals. Uh, and I can say that so far we've had no, uh, we've used no um, glyphosate uh, on our landscape property since this occurred. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we've learned from that activity um, since then. So in the parks landscapes, um, some of the issues with a, a pesticide ban is that we'd have less control, potentially greater infestations, potential fire fuels um, could accumulate on these properties. We have seen uh, in 2018, uh, when we didn't have a ban on uh, glyphosate, we saw that the landscape contract went from uh, $549,000 per year up to a little over a million dollars uh, per year with the no glyphosate ban uh, included uh, to manage weeds. Uh, so, so that has some uh, cost implications there. Um, and we have seen uh, increased weeds in our ball fields uh, and some of our civic landscapes and our street medians uh, uh, as, as this um, ban has taken place. Um, in Santa Rosa water, uh, some of the issues that we've seen is uh, while we can't ascribe this cost increase 100% to a pesticide ban, it, our cost went up $300,000 because, but it was a, a more holistic way of approaching the landscape. Uh, so that just costs more. Um, and it also could just be, you know, also time has gone on. So, so we can't ascribe that $300,000 100% to glyphosate. But we have seen um, we're on 100 mechanical removal uh, and so where we really struggle with managing weeds are in those hardscaped areas those little cracks um, has been difficult for us um, we have had to rely on and this is not a negative at all uh, increased use of grazing on our levees What's different about our properties is our properties are in the ag community. So we have cows right next door. So really all we have to do to put cows on our property is to open a gate, uh, which is a little bit different than in the urban areas um, to, to bring grazing in. But that's what we've done. Uh, and we have a number of separate contracts to, to manage that grazing. Um, if that were exported to uh, other properties in the city, we would expect there to be a considerable cost for the farmer to move those animals in and out as needed to provide the control. Um, and we have had a slight increase in weeds in our restoration areas. In particular, we have um, restoration along some of our creeks. And one of the problems we have out in the Laguna is we have this invasive plant called perennial pepperweed. Uh, and that has kind of spread. And that's a very difficult, that's a difficult plant to control without the use of um, glyphosate. Um, so um, the impact of pesticide bans on our parking properties. So um, uh, this would be increased weeds and lots in uh, our landscape areas and sidewalks where single space, multi-spacer meters 
are installed. This once again, it's those little crack areas between hardscape. Uh, it's very difficult to get mechanical equipment in there. Um, the parking um, group has opted out of the citywide landscape contract and is doing all that work in house uh, since 2022. Um, and if they were required to maintain these places without weeds, uh, they estimate they would probably need uh, additional two additional FTEs, uh, which would come up to a, a, an increase of $250,000 per year uh, to meet uh, the, the no weed standard uh, on those properties. And that parking uh, currently, uh, they're not spraying now. They currently are using uh, uh, engine, you know, uh, two-stroke engines to uh, manage this, uh, which also has impacts to the environment. So uh, here's Fountain Grove Parkway, and you can just see this is one of the things that we're concerned about um, on our traffic medians is that these are some of the most dangerous areas to work. The number one reason for workplace mortality is vehicle accidents. And so when we put staff in the middle of a road, um, we are putting them in harm's way. So if we're looking at um, uh, treating these mechanically, we either have this uh, frequency, a uh, high frequency of going out there, or if we're using um, the burn down chemicals, then we'd have to be going out once every week or two weeks uh, to maintain pests in, in these medians. Um, or if we leave the weeds in the medians, it gives an appearance the landscapes are not well maintain maintained. And so um, this is an area, and we'll talk about that in our suggestions. Uh, um, since people don't spend a lot of time in these areas, this might be an area uh, where we would allow something like glyphosate um, compared to other environments. And then I'm going to pass this over to Paul, a couple of slides to talk about. Uh, good evening, Paul Wendall, District Chief Fire Marshal with the Fire Department, uh, co-presenting on the next two slides. Um, so uh, kind of carrying where we uh, left off last night uh, with the passage of uh, at least the first reading of the new ordinance around our vegetation management uh, program, our recommendations that initially uh, came uh, from us starting back in 2019 with the development of the Community Wildfire Protection Plan. Uh, that plan, obviously, as part of what is required of the process is a lot of community involvement. Uh, and one of the uh, action items uh, and objectives of the policy and the, sorry, of the plan itself was to explore the use uh, of what this policy is intended to target to specifically mitigate uh, some of the fire risks. Uh, the community uh, during that time uh, was roughly, I believe about 66% uh, that were surveyed were in favor of using it for targeted applications to reduce the risk. Um, and right now, uh, it primarily is tied to the objective that improves our evacuation routes. Uh, the evacuation routes that we have primarily uh, in the city have both uh, medians, right-of-ways, uh, as well as open space alongside of them. What we're seeing, uh, which is outlined uh, in this, is the change of ecology in our burn scars. Uh, areas within our wildland urban interface primarily before 2017 used to be oak and grass woodlands, as we know, that's what made Fountain Grove beautiful. Uh, unfortunately, with the fire effects that we saw up there, it killed off our canopy. So our ordinance right now is targeting the results of what happened when we lost the canopy to try and reduce some of the fuel associated with a lot of the dead trees. But without the canopy, the sun that's penetrating the soil is changing what's growing. And that growth of Scotch broom, French broom is is spreading at a rate that is out of control and it's created an environment that is more dangerous today than it was in 2017. As part of our exploration of where this policy may go, we engaged with CAL FIRE uh, through our vegetation management program and started a project on the Thomas Lake Harris open, <coughs> Thomas Lake Harris open space uh, where we used funds from council, uh, uh, a line item from the pg &E settlement that went towards the vegetation management program to actually do field treatment on that property. And it was actually CAL FIRE's recommendation that that be used as a example of coming in, reducing the fuel mechanically. The scotch room in that location, as we mentioned last night, is upwards of about 14 to 15 feet uh, in height. Um, the goal is to do a low intensity burn of a lot of the fuels that are left after we do the mechanical treatment. And then their recommendation, uh, which uh, was to actually then follow up with a spray application on a, on a property like that. 
Um, that's our goal um, is to is to continue to use the community wildfire protection plan as again that framework to where appropriate uh, take steps and uh, meet our objections and actions that we bring forward to council annually uh, to uh, to mitigate that that risk. And we're not just doing just spraying. Uh, part of what we're continuing to do is also mechanical treatment uh, through uh, both our funds through the vegetation management program, but also grant opportunities. So we're not saying that spraying is the answer, but it's one of many tools in the toolbox that we find uh, would make uh, our community safer uh, and reduce the spread of fire and provide for uh, safer evacuation. Uh, the policy can also align again with what we talked about, the new ordinance. Uh, the ordinance kind of starting from the bottom up. As we saw, it will require the defensible space inspections uh, and compliance with all those properties within the wildland urban interface. And that makes up roughly 9,000 properties. Um, it will also prohibit the mulch around the structures, that fibrous gorilla hair mulch that was causing a lot of problems. As we just mentioned, removes uh, certain dead and down trees. Uh, but then uh, the other piece of it that is uh, kind of why all four of these are working together um, is Without all four of them, it's it's just not it's not completing all of our objectives. And the fourth one is getting rid of that uh, invasive species of vegetation that we specifically spelled out as Scotch broom and French broom. Um, it also does give us the authority to identify others. Uh, right now, we're looking at Bay, um, but we feel that this policy has the potential to help uh, mitigate that spread and and reduce some of the risks within our wildland urban interface. Thank you, Paul. So um, moving on from the impacts of, of pesticide bans, I just kind of like to make sure that um, everyone's understanding what a typical integrated pest management policy is. Uh, it really starts with pest identification. So you have to be knowledgeable about what you're trying to control. Uh, and then you do research in the least toxic methods to address and impacts to pests. And least toxic is typically in an integrated pest management policy from the focus of the, the individual applicator, right? So it's, it's really kind of like an OSHA protection. So the individual who's doing the pesticide application, so least toxic is what's gonna be least toxic to them uh, typically. Uh, and so as you move up and I'll talk a little bit more about it, there's different types of protective equipment you have to wear as you move up in the hierarchy of, of dangerous chemicals. Um, and then if action is needed to manage the pests, because many pests come in and go and we don't do anything about them, uh, apply a least, least toxic methods first and then evaluate if that's effective and then you move up the chain. Um, and that's just basically how an integrated pest management policy works. That's, you know, there's gonna be a lot of details. We typically will break down each of the different environments where we're acting. So we're not leaving it to the person in the field making these decisions. We're actually saying in this environment, this is what how we're going to start with this. And, and there is a process that an individual um, uh, person maintaining a property would go through before making a decision. Um, always start with non-pesticide actions first. I think um, um, that's clear. Like if you can set up a landscape in a way that doesn't foster the growth of weeds and invasive plants like uh, was discussed earlier that, you know, when we had a nice oak canopy over many of the landscapes, we didn't have as much broom growing up in the undergrowth. And once the oak canopy was gone, we got a lot of broom. So in the built environment, we also have that same issue. We can um, have dense plantings. So if we densely plant an area, it makes it very difficult for weeds to grow. I'm not gonna advocate ivy, but you can look at the ivy out front as an example. Uh, there's no weeds growing in that ivy because there's just no room. That's basically the concept of a dense planting. A lot of lawns uh, fulfill that uh, as well. So less of an open space, that's a way of, of designing landscapes. Uh, doing mechanical removal uh, where possible should always be your first step if that's a possibility uh, and it's easy to get at, then that's the, the way to go. Uh, if you have specific plants that, or, um, that you're using that they're problematic, uh, like they're more, uh, they get more diseases and things like that, consider replacing those. If they're plants that require a lot of care, 
try to use plants that don't uh, so that you're not wasting a bunch of time uh, fighting a battle that eventually is only handled with chemicals. Um, and then you use pesticides as a last resort. Uh, this is how standard integrated pest management works. Integrated pest management was designed to get people and, and landscape managers to move away from pesticides, move away from simple solutions, and think about the system and how to break that up. And so that's the process that we're proposing in the integrated pest management uh, process. So here's a picture of Depot Park, and these are mulched uh, areas around signage uh, to prevent weeds. Um, and these will need to be uh, remulched each year. Uh, going to the pesticide labels, their signal words. Um, caution, starting from the bottom, caution is the lowest. So when you, anytime you go to a store, well, when you, if you went to a store, you would most likely only see caution, and I believe you could see warning labels. You won't see danger labels. You will have to go to a special chemical supplier to get a danger uh, label. One of the things with glyphosate is glyphosate is listed as a caution. Um, it, it has a caution label. And the reason why it has a caution label is because its active ingredient targets um, the plant's ability to store starch. So it's a chemical process that we don't actually do in our bodies. It's, it's a chemical process that's specific to plants. So the active ingredient isn't necessarily um, targeting our biology. Compare that to an insecticide. We're animals too, or we're classified as animals too. Um, and that uh, you know anything that might affect a, an insect might have some ch difference to our body. Um, one thing that's interesting is many of the burn down organic chemicals come with a warning label. And the reason why is they're acidic. They're, they're almost always in a, an acid of some type and that'll cause burns and rashes. So they're more dangerous to staff who are applying them uh, compared to um, glyphosate. So you might see in an integrated pest management policy that you would start with glyphosate before you would start with a burn down chemical, because once again, that's focused on the safety of the individual who's applying the pesticide. Um, so some of the pest management solutions that we propose uh, in our policy is the, with insects is number one is to tolerate. Is this an insect infestation that you can uh, tolerate? Like it's not really, yeah, there's an insect there. Do we need to kill it? No then move on. Uh, if it is something that's causing disease and pathology to the plant, you need to identify it to make sure that you're, um, if you're gonna start to control it, that you know which control methods to work. So if, say you identified it with spider mites. Uh, well, spider mites are gonna occur on plants in areas that have poor circulation. So you could probably just prune that out, uh, get rid of it. And if the spider mites don't go away immediately, then you might spray. You'd use a lot less spray because you've gotten most of the infestation out of the area. So there's just a common sense approach um, in an integrated pest management that's all geared towards reducing um, the amount of spray used. Um, and if this plant species is just subject to these pests and you can't get rid of these pests, maybe it's time to consider uh, removing them. And because we're talking about a citywide integrated pest management, we have to think about all of our users and all of our needs for pest management. And so one of the concerns that um, we're going to bring up uh, a couple of times is the Luther Burbank Gardens. There are specific species there that we are protecting because they are heirloom varieties developed by Luther Burbank. And so there is a need to protect those species in perpetuity. Uh, I will say most Luther Burbank species are uh, well adapted to this climate, which means that they don't tend to need a lot of pesticides to manage them. And that's been some of the strength of his breeding program. Uh, but it is something where we can't just say, oh, well, we're not going to grow the Luther Burbank rose because it gets too much you know, disease and we have to spray it. Uh, to, for us to maintain that heritage, we would need to have um, some avenue to protect those species. So in pest management solutions for weeds, and I think this is something that has come up uh, as most of concern to city council is um, the, the management of weeds, right? Because glyphosate is solely for management of weeds. 
Uh, and your choices are to tolerate the weeds. Some weeds are more pleasurable than others. They might have pretty flowers. Um, once again, plant high density plantings and mulch and mechanical removal. Uh, we're also looking at grazing in some areas. And then as a last resort, um, we would use herbicides to control weeds. So uh, we do manage some of our infields in a number of ways. We have mechanical removal and grooming of these um, uh, areas. These are high weed infestation areas because you, you have um, grass right there and you need to have not grass right next to it and to keep that border as clean as possible and keep them from starting. It is much more beneficial to apply an herbicide before grooming the course or grooming the fields um, so that you kill the plants at the root and then cover them. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that in our recommendations. Uh, pest management solutions for plant diseases, though we didn't talk about this. Um, there hasn't been any bans on any other chemicals um, uh, other than glyphosate and an insecticide. But when looking at fungus diseases or other kinds of diseases, um, there's different types of, of things that you might do. So can you tolerate the disease? Can the plant survive with that disease? Um, if, if not, uh, you need to identify the disease and make sure that you're um, doing the appropriate disease control. So in this case, um, this picture, that's uh, rust on a rose leaf. You can mechanically remove the infected leaves, get them out of the garden. That would be a, a way if you're trying to get um, award-winning roses, most likely you're gonna need to spray with some sort of a, um, a, a fungicide uh, and that can be copper sulfate, sulfur or other uh, product. Many of those are organic. There's a lot of organic solutions there. Uh, if you have something like fire blight, which will kill a tree, looks like somebody torched it, you have to cut it out immediately. There's really not an effective spray for that. So you, it's really important when you have a disease that you know what you're targeting before, before you make a management action. And that's what we're trying to convey through this integrated pest management um, policy that in addition to any product bans we're talking about, we're trying to also cover all these common sense ways of addressing um, uh, managing the landscape with the least amount of chemicals possible. So I go through a couple of slides on our staff suggestions on pes pesticide bans. Uh, we do believe a complete ban of neonicotinoids is appropriate. Uh, it's, it's just the right decision to make. We hardly use any insects that have insecticides. It really wouldn't affect our operations in any ways that we can see, but it would also put a really good um, first foot forward to make sure that we aren't just using these blanket insecticides, that we are targeting our pests um, uh, better uh, by being knowledgeable about what the issue is. Um, we also are suggesting that uh, we minimize the use of all pesticides throughout the uh, city um, through the um, uh, integrated pest management policy and that if we are applying or anybody is applying uh, pesticides on our behalf that we would require a certified pesticide applicator to be um, on site to supervise those individuals to make sure that all of the appropriate protections for the, the worker and the environment are taken uh, while uh, applying pesticides. We are also proposing uh, to ban glyphosate use in most sensitive areas. And we've identified those as playgrounds, public gathering spaces, uh, picnic areas where people might be eating um, and other areas that are identified as sensitive receptors that we hadn't thought of at the time of this. But, but it makes a lot of sense where we're gonna have a lot of human contact with that, that the concern about glyphosate, let's make sure in the areas where people are really integrating with the landscape that we're not playing, uh, putting it in there. Uh, but then we also would ask for a few specific, specific exemptions and I'll go through that, exceptions and I'll go through that. So the exceptions to the glyphosate ban would be, uh, as Paul was just talking about, allowing cases of public health and safety. So if it is determined, if in any of these areas, 
that we need to have effective control above what we're able to do mechanically and the best management practices are to use glyphosate that in the name of public health and safety, uh, we would be allowed to do that. Uh, we would also ask that we'd be allowed to use them in road medians and parking structures, since these aren't areas of, of a lot of, you know, hands and mouths uh, touching and putting things in our mouths, uh, that it, it would be uh, safe to the uh, environment and be safe for the workers to use a, a chemical that would get the job done in a single application compared to a, a weekly or biweekly applications. Uh, we would also uh, request to allow the glyphosate use on ball fields, but only when they're closed for renovations and the public is kept out um, and not during active fields. We'd only use mechanical removal during the active season uh, and also allow use on invasive plants. And so this is this is straight from the county's ordinance, which I think is a very well done, is it's a non-routine activity. And that's really what an integrated pest management uh, program is about, is saying, let's get, let's, we'll use herbicides when it's non-routine, but let's make sure that there isn't a need for routine use of herbicides. Um, and so if we can target invasive plants and have a control program designed to control those plants, as was outlined with the broom, uh, that we have a very specific regimen you know, mowing, get rid of a bunch of the above ground biomass first and burning it, uh, and then just treating the sprouts as they come up. Instead of spraying on a 15 foot tall canopy, you're spraying on six inch shoots. That's a whole heck of a lot less herbicide that's used. So it's not a ban in that case. It's, it's, a, it's a significant reduction, um, getting closer to zero. And then once we have uh, achieved the control objectives, we can decrease or eliminate any herbicide use for those things. But it's one thing for staff to stand in front of you and give you a presentation that we promise we'll do the best uh, that we can and ask you to trust us. But we're also trying to uh, uh, unlock transparency to what we're doing so that council has an ability to take a look and say, hey, they said they were gonna reduce pesticide use, but I'm, I'm not feeling that's what's happening. Well, let's get out of feelings. We'll report the data annually. Um, we'll create a website to highlight the activities that we're doing to prevent pesticide use. And on that website, we'll have our IPM policies so the public is aware of what our policy is. Um, we'll have tips for people on how they could manage pests uh, uh, without pesticides, the same things that we're doing. Uh, and then provide an annual report of our pesticide use on all our city properties. All pesticide applications, um, part of this transparency, would be posted prior to when we're spraying and, um, and listing uh, the date of the application. This is an above and beyond what's required by law, but this gives the public a right to know of what we're doing on these properties so that they can make a decision for, for themselves. Um, and, but it also allows us to um, protect the environment and our employees. And then when planning to uh, apply pesticides, close the area uh, to the public and post these signs about the um, pesticide application. A good example, the city of Davis, I'm not gonna read everything on this slide about that, but I just took a, a screenshot of their um, pesticide, integrated pest management uh, policy. They have it up, they have all the information and it's incredibly transparent. And I would urge you if you wanted to look at things, this is kind of a model that we would be looking at to develop our web page that would share our use of pesticides. And so, Really the next steps would be to hear your feedback on what uh, we've proposed today, uh, make some modifications to our proposals to the, the full council based on your feedback uh, and try to uh, move through with the, the full council to getting a, um, a good guidance so that we can bring a full integrated pest management policy before the council for um, review and hopeful adoption. Interested to questions? No, 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 no. <laughs> um, all right, let's go ahead and uh, start with public comment then before we give feedback. 
Anybody here for comment? All right, we'll bring it back. Um, you want me to go first? So first of all, I really appreciate you're trying to thread the needle between uh, a phenomenally complicated issue and the impact of the issue. I will say one of the things that's um, noticeable in the presentation is it focuses primarily on cost and outcome. Uh, when part of why we brought this in the first place was concerns from the public about their waterways, about uh, the way that it, when we use pesticides in an area, it creates almost a self-fulfilling prophecy about then you need more pesticides to actually manage the area than if you use other types. And you give a nod to it, proper design and uh, mechanical. Um, I'm fine with us, this is the subcommittee level, I'm fine with us sending this to the council for discussion. Um, I imagine what you're going to hear from council members, probably myself and, and many folks in the public, is that it it's a good attempt but somewhat misses the mark on what we're trying to achieve in terms of looking at health and safety and ecology. Uh, like, for instance, we don't talk at all about the impact that pesticides have on the bugs in the area, the good bugs, right? Um, or the good types of plants. Um, so I think that there will be more of a discussion that folks are going to want to have around those impacts, um, not just what the impact on the city budget is, not just, yes, there are more weeds uh, with, with organics, but, but really looking at it kind of holistically. Um, I appreciate the nod also to workers. I think that was a substantial part of why we moved this direction too, was concerned that we were hearing from folks about the actual individuals that were uh, applying the pesticides broadly um, and making sure that we weren't setting them as well as our kids playing in parks and whatnot up for success. Uh, I do think what we'll hear from the public is while that's, that part uh, looks like we've done a lot with it, even when we close parks, kids are gonna play in it, uh, right? And so how do we help navigate that as well? Um, I love the transparency aspect. I, th I think that that's really important and we've heard that from folks. Uh, and I will say uh, one thing that I'd like to see come with the recommendation is you laid out in the very beginning what we can do on our properties, what we can't do on others, uh, but what we certainly can do is request that the county, that the state, uh, especially Caltrans has been a big part of the discussion, uh, request that they follow our plans in our area. Um, I know, for instance, Damon Connolly, uh, our newest assembly member that represents the south portion of the city, he had legislation last year to require Caltrans to follow what the Board of Supervisors has set as their IPMs, right? Um, I, I'm very interested in seeing us follow the Russian River model since that seems to be the, the one that's, that's the best. But I do want to give an opportunity for experts to actually weigh in at council on what they are seeing as the impact. Um, and we'll see where the, where the discussion goes. There. Um, starting with the non-pesticide actions first, I had a question, I think you answered it, but in a situation where you already know non-pesticides is not going to work, like the, all the weeds that you have to take care Scotch of. Scotch and fox yeah. yeah, where you know it's not going to work. You don't still have to go through, to me it's a waste of time, you don't still have to go through the process. No, um, it's, can I just you can talk address that question? You. Okay, because um, I also want to get to some of your... Oh yeah, absolutely, uh, happy to do yeah. that back and forth. Um, but uh, no, the, the plan would be that, so there's a lot of, we're not going to be experimenters, right? There, there's a lot of literature out there. Uh, the California Invasive Plant uh, Pest Council, uh, puts out a whole bunch of information on how to manage weeds. The uh, California Native Plant Society is, does as well. Um, and there's a lot of information on how to handle and manage individual pests. So once you identify that, then you go to the re resources and, and utilize that uh, a playbook. And you see how that works in your area. And so... Um, so in the case of Broom, relying on the expertise of Cal Fire, uh, that they found that that woody species, it'll re-sprout after you burn it. That's one of its, that's why it does so well after fires. It come, it's, it's a common 
Uh, and when a fire comes through, if you have broom anywhere around, it's going to seed that area and it's going to grow up like a, a, a fresh, you know, green carpet at uh, 15 feet tall is, is pretty, that's pretty good habitat for the broom, you know? Uh, so, uh, you know, there's, we would use tried and true techniques uh, uh, for that. Uh, invasive species, that, that's the key. And that's like why I mentioned pepperweed uh, earlier. That is a very specific weed. There's other plants that, okay, they're gonna grow. They're not gonna become a problem. Some plants become problems. Uh, pepperweed will create a monoclonal uh, population. It'll just be a dense patch that nothing but pepperweed will grow. Mm -hmm. um, and broom will do much the same thing. Choke out, it'll prevent uh, oaks from getting reestablished. Uh, and so the approach they're talking about is really one targeted that allows the oak trees to come back. And it's really about when you talk about the environment and integrated pest management is all about protecting the environment. It's about minimizing the amount of pesticide that's used so that you, there's not as much runoff, you know, and there's not as much of an impact on the environment. So if you reduce it by uh, uh, 90% by doing the mechanism, they're not spraying standing. They're spending a lot of energy and time cutting, burning, and then treating, right? So um, that's so that they are reducing the amount of pesticides that they're spraying. So I think, uh, I think it's a good point that you made that we haven't talked enough in our presentation about the need to limit spraying. And it sounds like all we're asking is to spray, spray, spray. And, and that's, I think it's because no, I came from an assumption of an, we're at this agreement point and we're, we haven't made the argument for why we're already there. But I, I think it would be good for the full council to bring that in. It, it, to be clear, you didn't come across like you just want to spray, spray, spray. Yeah, I, I, think, I, I, I thought you did a really good job and, and everything was really balanced. I just wanted to make sure we didn't lose sight of the reasons why people asked us to move in this direction, uh, which was not cost, right? Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it is so great to say it's not cost, but cost is always a, a factor. And so I'm happy that you put that in. I, I would also like to know, like, if we don't, how much time does it take or what would be the cost if we don't do something or what are the, the, the consequences of not having, of not having this? Right. So would it be so we're talking about staff. Yeah. Right. So would it be that our our, our medians are going to be. Look like a, a, a field like is that is that what we want? I can answer that question on behalf of parks. I come up there to answer it. Oh, you go ahead and yell from the back. OK, <laughs> um, just in the, in the world of parks, when we talk about uh, the amount of increase by not spraying, uh, we look at it as a 58 percent increase. So for labor hours associated with that, for parks specifically, that's 31,000 hours a year that we have to put back into managing the weeds if we don't have the ability to spray. Like mm -hmm. you were saying, cost is always a factor, and I appreciate the, that, that that's not what was brought forward, but in, in our world, cost is the factor and this is a tool that we had and we were able to use for a long time. I'm not, I don't have the luxury of being able to say whether we should or shouldn't based on my opinion, but you've taken a tool away from us that now equates to almost 15 FTEs. So there's gotta be a give somewhere. It's not, you're not giving us staff, but you're also taking the tool away. So um, yeah, for us, it's 58% it's, it's increase in labor. And so I think you see in our proposal is is kind of targeting the the safety aspects of it. So I think medians, one of the challenges that there, there, there could be medians that are are more important than others. Right. Like the um, yeah, and evacuation all, routes. Right. And along what James was talking about they're taking on additional staff to deal with the medians, but also because the city continues to take on more and more land when the development takes place and they essentially gift land over, it takes more people to manage that. One of the struggles that we deal with is every, typically every year is we set priorities and we discuss in between whether it's public works, whether it's parks, whether it's fire, 
the priorities of the city, right? And so the more time that park staff is spending on medians, the less time they're able to spend on other priorities that we've set as a city to address the fire risk. And quite honestly, sometimes it feels like we're just rolling the dice that when, whether it's, whether it's public streets crews, whether it's parks crews are focusing on those priority areas that could be addressed by spraying, they're not dealing with other areas that may be of a less priority, but can cause more damage if, if not an equal amount of damage. So there really is a, some true benefits to being able to, to, to take that off of their plate and spray it because we, we get regrowth, right? One of the things that we keep asking for in Santa Rosa is more and more rain. But we sometimes cringe because it's like that happy balance, right? We don't want drought because then we've got the increased fire risk. We get more and more rain, what happens? Yeah, our fire risk goes down, but our regrowth takes place. And then we have this window of opportunity, typically every September, October, we're battling with that regrowth, drying back out, trying to shift those crews around when, when they can be used somewhere else. So I would suggest that you be ready with that information because I think that it is going to, to come up. I really feel council can't have it both all the ways, right? Mm -hmm. if, they're, if we're gonna take away a tool, then we need to be able to, to give you something to replace the tool. Um, I would, because I don't know very much about pesticides and stuff, I would like to see um, what it does to the environment. I think that that is a, a good learning tool for people that yeah. don't know. So not like 20 slides on what it does for the environment, but like a, don't tell me to look it up. No, 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 I was gonna laugh because uh, for a climate action committee, I saw we had a dozen people listening to the presentation. So I'm pretty sure you'll get emails from people letting <laughs> you know the, that it's a very active group of folks who have been working on this. And I think what we will hear is give them 15 more FTEs to, to be able to manage. Yeah, and, and I'm not so. saying to not do, yeah, yeah, to, not, to not get rid of pesticides. What I'm saying is I think that if we take away a tool that the council needs to step up to the plate and be willing to look at tools that we can give you, whether that's FTEs or that's something else, because we can't keep taking away and not help you to do a job that we're asking yeah, you agreed. to do. That's not manageable. Yep. Um, so I do look at the staff and I also look at the environment and I look at how it's affecting the public. And I get emails from people that don't like the medians yeah. high because that does not, they don't feel like that is a good reflection of the beautiful city that we live in. Yep. So it's a mixed bag and we're, we're trying to juggle, but we have to give you tools is my opinion. So come with background on things like how many FTEs and, and how this is managed. And if they're doing medians, if they're not gonna be able to do the stuff that we need them to do, um, that could pose a, a greater risk yeah. to our city. So I am hearing, throw this to the full council. Um, and I know that the mayor will work uh, to get that on at a time that's that's appropriate here. Um, and uh, thank you so much for the work. As the mayor said, it's, it's not an easy balance to strike. Uh, there's a lot of opinions and a lot of strong opinions on it and a lot of experts and a lot of non-experts who are still interested. Um, so we'll see where the, the conversation goes with the full council for sure. All right. Do you feel like you received because I know I was all over the place because it kind of is. Well, I, I, I think I'd like to, you know, maybe hear some specifics on our, our suggestions, the staff suggestions, if, if there are some concerns that you had. Um, is it okay if I bring this back up? Oops. If we go back to, I think it's 15. Slide 15, I would just say like who has the authority to say that pesticides is the last resort? Like who who has that authority? Would it be a, a manager or would it be um, like who makes that decision? I think would probably be a big thing too. It's not just uh, this is too hard. We're going to go to pesticides. Well, um, that's a great question. Um, we don't, it would be, um, it would be informed by the uh, licensed pesticide applicator. So, and 
I would assume that it would be made by the manager of the group that would be managing. So in parking, the parking manager in parks, uh, probably either um, supervisor or um, a deputy director, uh, you know, it, but that, that could be at the direction of the council. It, it would be awkward if, if it went to council. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It would make it very difficult to, to manage, um, and it might be too much in the weeds, you know, for uh, yeah. <laughs> good pun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're right up Chris's alley with that one. I was ripping for the right joke. Up Chris's alley. <laughs> <laughs> that was so. That was so. Uh, for for a city manager, but yeah. but it's it's really the policy lays out a procedure. Mm -hmm. And that's what staff are following. And that's why we want to develop a policy that lays out a procedure and a logic um, that we can get behind. And then if when we are doing our annual reporting and we're gathering up all that information, put together the annual report, there's cause for concern, then direction can be provided to make changes in how those decisions are being made. Or a justification can be made for why, are, why did our pesticide use go up so much this year? Maybe it is because we just had a fire and we got fire fuels and that they needed to be, you know, that there's specific reasons for that, that. You know, one of the things I find interesting is I think there's a public perception that we're spraying a lot. And the reality is we don't spray hardly at all. We haven't sprayed in years. And even when we could spray, we hardly ever sprayed. You know, so it isn't, there's this perception that there's like a lot of use when there really isn't. Um, and sometimes when you see somebody spraying something, the assumption is that must be the worst thing that they could be spraying. It could be uh, a fertilizer. It could be, you know, a whole host of things are, are applied through a spray. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't, no, oh, there's the slide number. So what would, what 15. would some of the other things that you think people would be concerned about when it comes to what they present it? Yeah, I, th I think, uh, and this is why probably it's it's hard for us to get into a back and forth too much about it without it being a council <laughs> and make sure the folks have a chance to actually digest what we've talked about. And uh, I think the number one thing that I hear from folks is um, not zero, that they, they understand that there are some applications that make sense. Like I imagine some of the folks that I've worked with would have absolutely no problem with it being in the WUI where you have less uh, involvement of people, uh, right? And understanding that ecologically, it could help to bring back the region to make it more sustainable long-term. I think that they are concerned about the transparency. They're concerned about the amount, uh, particularly, as I mentioned, the, the Caltrans issue has has been a particular uh, uh, thorn in the thorn in the craw because they get told how much was spent, but they don't get told where, and they don't have any say over uh, what, right? So I think that'll go over really well with folks. Um, and I think uh, until they can kind of look at it, and I think what we're always going to hear is exactly that trade-off. Um, why don't you just have more people who can do mechanical removal? Um, so that's that's why I'm a little bit hesitant to get into too much of the back and okay. forth is what I think you're presenting here is a really thoughtful approach to try to navigate those two. Uh, didn't mean to sound as critical as I was. I just want to make sure we don't lose sight of the human aspect of why we're doing this when we present to the full council yeah. and perhaps some information and data around that would be important. Uh, but I do think that you're trying to strike a, a, a balance between ideal versus possible. Yeah. And I will say that after the last meeting, I did go and read the the um, the county parks integrated pest management policy that they recently passed, and the the board of supervisors passed a ban on on um, glyphosate use. But then they had this list of exceptions that are are very much in align alignment with what we're proposing. You know that it is really targeted towards a minimization more than a, an outright ban, but um, providing this kind of guidance like we have here um, has been very uh, helpful. Uh, and we just want to make sure that um, as the, you know, 
we've become so much, I mean, I don't think I knew about the wildland urban interface, sorry, Paul, <laughs> before 2017, I, I wasn't really aware of that. And I'm a person who pays a lot of attention to things around vegetation and plants. I just thought uh, that wooey was what you yelled on a roller coaster? Or? Yeah. <laughs> Goodness. Sorry. Right. Well, it was. <laughs> so, so I think I have a, enough information um, uh, from from your statements, and it sounds like we're yeah we're ready for bringing this to council. So, yeah. appreciate your time. No, thank you. Thank you for the chair. Yeah. Just uh, really quickly, in terms of uh, next steps, we are targeting. Uh, the January Council meeting for study sessions. Perfect. Great. And it'll be very similar to this presentation. Yeah. With, uh, a little bit of input uh, from your, you know, so a few additional slides with your input. Hopefully we keep getting rain until then so that we can have a more full conversation about what it looks like. <laughs> He's like, great. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. This is the right time for it to rain, right, Paul? Exactly. <laughs> right. Um, all right. We'll take a look at uh, future agenda items. That's 6.1. We have the upcoming uh, meetings list that folks can click on and, and can check out. Um, one thing that I will mention is I've gotten a lot of feedback from folks in the Burbank Gardens area in particular that they're interested in ways to make uh, tree canopy easier for them to, to bring in. So I have mentioned that to the to the city manager, and that might be one that I can work with staff on, uh, but specifically around making it easier for them to get the permits to put in proper sized tree boxes in front of their homes. Um, and so we can talk about what that looks like uh, for creating more of a, a, an urban canopy, not just for that neighborhood, but that's where the, the conversation is coming from, but really around the entire city, especially in areas where there's not much for you to walk under uh, and it increases the heat island effect. So, but I'll work with staff on that. I just wanted to acknowledge that I've met with a number of neighbors that they're very interested in this. Uh, and I think uh, for the most part, we can all agree more trees is usually a good thing. Anything else? Pest resistant ones. Yeah, pest resistant <laughs> No. Cool. All right, thanks everybody. Chair Walters, before we adjourn, could we do public comment on non-agenda items. Oh yeah, great call. I'm um, sorry I missed that on our agenda. Uh, let's go ahead and call for it and see if there's anybody here to give comment. Looks like no. Thank, right, you. thank you. And we're adjourned. And we're adjourned. And you.